working with the quail, it's always a little bit funny to me thinking back because first thing out of college, I actually went to work for a dairy company. That was fine, but it wasn't quite what I had been meaning to do with my life. I went back to school and took all the core courses in wildlife biology. And then when I finished those courses, I got my first position out here at Buenos Aires. Before this was a national wildlife refuge, it was a ranch. And so the name of the ranch was Buenos Aires Ranch. All this land was bought up from the ranch in order to protect the endangered mass bobwhite. Good morning, you guys. The mass bobwhite is mostly found in Sonora, Mexico. Where we are right now at Buenos Aires in southern Arizona is considered the northernmost part of their historical range. Those first sightings were being recorded in like the late 1800s, pretty much about the time they found the bird. They were noticing, you know, we're not seeing a lot of this bird. They already found it in a state of decline. Basically, as soon as the Endangered Species Act was drafted, mass bobwhite went on like right at the beginning. They're one of the first species that were on there. We didn't have a lot of chances to really study them in the wild like you might with other species. And so there's a lot of questions out there that are not fully answered about their history and their preferences, you know, habitat-wise, food-wise, raising young. All right, guys, see you later. Part of, you know, the decline can be attributed to the changing landscape because of ranching, but you cannot blame ranching for their decline in its entirety. You've got decades of drought that were changing the landscape. And so we always have to be doing different kinds of habitat restoration efforts. We have prescribed burns, reseeding with native plant species. And so you have all these efforts that you have to do, you know, to help the mass bobwhite, but not hinder other, you know, other wildlife species on the refuge. About 2017 is when the reintroduction side of the program got revamped. Our second facility is in Oklahoma with our partners. They kind of have a duplicate of our flock. Just in case something catastrophic happened, everyone's not in one place. And so they focus on providing those chicks for the summer brood releases. Four times over the summer months, they are going to utilize Lighthawk, which is made up of pilots who have their own airplane. They donate their time, they donate their plane, they donate their fuel. We had almost 300 birds on the plane today. So we're here in three hours, although we've never lost a bird. It's interesting, because you get the birds on there, you, you, it's like being in a barnyard for three hours. Uh, but it, it's, really, it's really cool. And it's important to kind of get the species going again. We'll meet the plane and we'll go ahead and pick up those birds, you know, and we'll bring them back down to the refuge. We'll divide the chicks up into those brooder boxes with the parents and that starts the fostering process or the bonding process. We're going straight to, hey, like, here's your kids, please, please take these, you know? And so it's, it's, it's a little bit unnatural because you're just skipping all those things that they would have done in the wild before they got to, here's my kids. You know, we do tend to have more success using a male as the foster parent than we do with the female. That's not to say we don't have females who take because we do. Somewhere in, you know, the range of 10 to 14 days, we prepare the boxes, we get the chicks in the boxes. And then we, we drive out to those, those designated spots that we've already picked. When they come out, you wanna make sure that they're not in the wide open. You don't want them to be picked off immediately upon coming out. You want them to have a nice kind of safe zone. and they just kind of wander off into the grass and disappear with their parent. When we're releasing the broods, the chicks are too small to wear a radio. Um, so the, the foster parent will get the radio collar. So each bird has its own frequency on that radio. 
And so you're using your antenna to basically hone in on that frequency and then you're able to go and locate that bird. This program's been going on for a lot of years and we've probably still got a lot of years ahead of us, but you know, the dream is to get to that point where those birds are, are thriving and surviving and we don't need to reintroduce. We don't even need to have captive birds because they're out there and they don't need us anymore. And so that's, that's what success is, is to have multiple generations of wild-born birds out there making a population that is self-sustaining. If you're in this field, you've seen what mankind does to the earth, the changes that we've made, and, and that has effects on wildlife. It just does. We're here because we're supposed to be stewards of the earth, and we're sharing this earth with all kinds of other wildlife, including this little bird. And it doesn't affect someone in another state. It doesn't even affect people in this state. But, you know, these birds matter. You know, all wildlife out here matters. You know, there's the ecosystem, there's a balance, and, and it's thrown out of balance when we destroy habitat. Does it affect you and I, our life, if they're not here? No, it doesn't, but you know, they were here too, and they deserve to still be here.